In this lecture, I'll discuss Chapter 3 of Lavenda and Schultz's Anthropology, What Does It Mean to Be Human? Uh, this chapter looks at evolutionary theory and what it can tell us about human variation. I'm going to start off with a discussion of race. From there, I'll move into evolutionary studies, both microevolution, meaning small or, or a relatively short period of time uh, in a given species, versus macroevolution, where you have uh, multiple species, um, the um, new species coming into existence and other species going extinct. Uh, finally, I'll conclude with the discussion of dating methods in paleoanthropology and archaeology with reference to both relative dating and numerical dating. As you've seen from the course materials, uh, the films, the American Anthropological Association's website on race, race uh, is a social construct. Uh, however, as Washburn pointed out early on, uh, it's biological meaningless. He rejected the race-based physical anthropology of the 19th and 20th centuries, noting that human population genetics has shown that different human populations from all over the world share basically the same range of genotypic variation no matter how different they may appear phenotypically, thus reinforcing the position of the concept of race is biologically meaningless. If you remember from last time, we talked about the idea of phenotypic expression of the genotype. In terms of, of why this is biologically meaningless, we see that the notion of the Klein comes into play here. The Klein is the gradual intergradation of genetic variation from population to population, but it's only along the lines of a single trait, not a group of traits. Hence, where we see the concept of race today in the United States uh, in terms of skin color. Um, skin color is based on melanins or pigments of the skin, or you have darker skin at the equator to lighter skin at the poles. As adaptive against skin uh, damage uh, with light pigmentation at the poles to darker pigmentation at the equator in order to favor uh, vitamin D production through the absorption of uh, beneficial uh, UV radiation. Now, to say that race is biologically meaningless is not to say that it's not meaningful. Indeed, as we've seen, in fact, very recently, in 1994, uh, Murray and Hernstein's piece on the bell curve has alleged that intelligence is largely inherited uh, based on genes. Uh, at the same time, uh, race can also be meaningful in the sense of political structure, struggles of politically and economically marginalized communities, or imagined communities, as Benedict Anderson refers to them as. Um, this is the notions of environmental justice or environmental racism. Um, and you see what you see here is a, uh, the allegation that the siting of polluting industries is near communities of color, whether these be African American, Latino communities, or uh, Native American populations in the lower 48. The AAA responded, the American Anthropological Association responded to the bell curve. Um, noting that they were deeply concerned by recent public discussions, Murray Hernstein's bell curve, uh, which imply that, race, that intelligence is biologically determined by race. This has been repeatedly challenged by scientists. These, nev these ideas nevertheless continue to be advanced. They distract scholarly and public attention. Uh, the AAA resolves that whereas all human beings are members of one species, Homo sapiens, and differentiating species into biologically defined races has proven meaningless and unscientific as a way of explaining variation, whether in intelligence or in any other type of trait. Therefore, the American Anthropological Association urges the academy, our political leaders, and our communities to affirm without distraction by mistaken claims of racially determined intelligence, the common stake in assuring equal opportunity of respecting diversity and in securing harmonious quality of life for all people. From here, I'm going to go into a discussion of the different subfields of evolutionary studies. And as I mentioned previously, there's both macroevolution and microevolution. Microevolution, we think of micro as small, short-term evolutionary changes that occur within a given species over relatively few generations. Versus macroevolution, these are long-term evolutionary changes, uh, especially looking at the origin of new species and the diversification across space and time, uh, indeed over millions of years of geologic time. The four evolutionary processes that can affect changing gene frequencies in a population over time include natural selection and mutation, as discussed by Alfred Russell Wallace and Charles Darwin, um, gene flow and genetic drift. Darwin and Wallace's work uh, on natural selection and mutation note that natural selection occurs when genetic mutation leads to varying individuals in each generation, and those which are best suited produce more offspring, hence it's not survival of the fittest per se, but those best suited to uh, a particular environment, or rather fit enough. Uh, 
Um, and this goes to the idea of mutations. These are the creation of a new allele for a gene when a portion of the DNA molecule to which it corresponds is suddenly altered. And so thing, alleles look at things like um, uh, hair, hair color, um, uh, um, uh, things like um, uh, eye color, and, and whatnot. An example of mutation in natural selection in different populations uh, occurs with hemoglobin. Hemoglobin uh, acts on the red blood cells uh, in order to um, be a binder site for both oxygen and carbon dioxide, so uh, to nourish cells uh, as, as well as to get rid of uh, waste products. Um, in many populations have only one allele, uh, uh, hemoglobin A. Uh, hemoglobin S is the, uh, the uh, variety, the, uh, one mutant form of hemoglobin sickle cell. Um, this has this has less opportunities for binding for oxygen, uh, and this is important or confers an advantage in mosquito-borne malaria parasites, uh, where you have malaria that's present in a given area. Um, generally, this advantage is with balanced polymorphism of the heterozygous genotype of both HBA and HBS. If, however, you have an expression of homozygous recessive, um, the HBS HBS, you have 85% mortality. Uh, prior to adulthood. Um, indeed, as the American Anthropological Association's website on race points out, the relative distributions of both sickle cell trait and malaria distribution mirror one another. Indeed, to say that sickle cell anemia is an African disease would be incorrect looking at things like the geographic distribution um, throughout the southern Europe, the Middle East, and the Indian subcontinent, uh, as well as throughout Africa as well. Gene flow and genetic drift. Uh, gene flow is the exchange of genes that occurs when a given population experiences a sudden expansion due to in-migration of outsiders from another population of the species. So um, this is essentially what happened in the 15th century, where you see the European movement uh, into areas where they had not previously been, uh, allowing for more gene flow between what had been relatively isolated populations prior to this. Genetic drift are, is, can be thought about as random changes in gene frequencies from one generation to the next due to a sudden reduction in population size. Uh, this can be a result of disaster, a disease, or outmigration of a small uh, subgroup from a larger population. Um, again, this is relatively random. If you think about in the context of things like disaster, for example, if you have um, animals that are uh, terrestrial animals and they are not, uh, uh, don't have uh, access to um, getting out of the uh, way you would, in fact, uh, uh, of a pyroclastic flow, uh, the disaster would eliminate um, the sort of ran ra eliminate randomly the uh, members of a given population. Now, um, gene flow, genetic drift, mutation, uh, and natural selection lead to both variation within populations as well as variation between populations. It's important to keep in mind that natural selection can act to either increase or decrease both variation within populations and variation between populations. Uh, some key terms, um, this notion of plasticity or physiologic flexibility, this allows organisms to respond to the environmental stresses such as temperature changes. This is exhibited by all living organisms. Uh, it's incorrect, however, to assume that genes uh, direct the development of organisms. Development is a uh, key in producing organisms with distinctive phenotypes, however. Uh, adaptation can be thought of in two ways the mutual shaping of organisms in their environment, and the shaping of useful features of an organism by natural selection for the function they now perform. Acclimatization refers to a change in the way the body functions in response to physical stress. This can either be short-term in the sense of going outside without enough clothing on, shivering, trying to generate enough body heat with your muscles uh, in order to protect your internal organ organs or regulate their temperature or developmental acclimatization in zones of hypoxia or areas where there's less oxygen, you see populations with larger chest dimension and lung capacity over time. Now, trying to attribute every phenotypic trait of an organism to adaptation is problematic. If we think, for example, of the wings of contemporary insects, initially these started off as cooling buds, which would not have allowed for flight to occur. But over time, this was the, um, over, over the course of evolution, you see the development of wings in contemporary insects. So this is the notion of exaptation. Phenotypes are also shaped by environments as well as genes. There was the notion that the Maya of Guatemala were quote unquote pygmy people. 
Uh, Barry Bogan looked at this and did measurements and anthropometric measurements of height, weight, body composition, and development, and really was looking at the question of whether this was a genetic adaptation to harsh environment or zones of hypoxia, relatively minimal oxygen. But what he found, rather, was that when these populations came to the United States in comparing Guatemalan and uh, Mayan populations in Guatemala and the United States, that in fact, in the United States, you had um, the uh, increased development along uh, all measures of anthropometry, uh, increase in stature, growth, body composition, height, weight, these sorts of things. Um, in terms of uh, human biological and cultural evolution, your text describes different for formal models. I'm just going to briefly touch on these. These are mathematical formulas which predict the outcomes of particular kinds of human interactions under different hypothesized conditions. The key one that I want to focus on is the notion of sociobiology by E.O. Wilson. Um, this is a neo-Darwinian evolutionary school of thought. Um, it was initially developed by Hamilton and Williams, but it got considerable influence after 1975 in the backing of E.O. Wilson. Again, this is gene-centered explanations for human evolution, so everything can be explained at the genetic level. Um, so altruistic behavior can, in fact, be explained at the genetic level for preservation of your genes of close relatives or kin who one lives in close proximity with. Some critical models include Boyd's and Richardson's gene uh, culture coevolution model, uh, the cultural group selection, um, as well as niche construction, which looks at the triple inheritance at the genetic level, uh, cultural level, as well as additional, and these are modified selection pr pressures that we in fact pass on to our descendants in the form of a constructed niche or environment. And of course, we can see this with uh, infrastructure and buildings amongst uh, Homo sapiens. Macroevolution uh, refers to long-term evolutionary changes, especially the origin of new species and the diversification across space and over millions of years of geologic time. Now, uh, the evidence for this comes from both fossils and comparative anatomy of living organisms. Darwin's views on macroevolution was essentially was what was happening uh, with um, the, uh, the process of natural selection mutation or microevolution over uh, long periods of time. Again, a slow, gradual transformation of a single species over time. Uh, this idea became known as phyletic gradualism, the theory that one species will gradually transform itself into a new species over time, wherein the actual boundary between species cannot actually be detected. Species A and species B, where does one begin, where does one end? The actual boundary is not uh, apparent. The critique of phyletic gradualism comes from Gold and Eldridge in Claudogenesis. It cannot explain everything evolutionary theory must explain. In fact, as Golden Elders note, most of evolutionary history has consisted of relatively stable species existing in co-equilibrium with one another. The uh, species selection may operate among variant related species. This is punctuated at a particular point in time. This relative stable species coexisting in equilibrium is punctuated by sudden bursts of speciation where extinctions are widespread and many new species will appear. This is the notion of punctuated equilibrium. If you're a visual person, I'd recommend uh, looking at uh, some graphic uh, models of this, uh, different uh, species and the transformation uh, over time in the context of phyletic gradualism and punctuated equilibrium. Finally, I'll conclude with a brief discussion of dating methods in paleoanthropology and archaeology. That is, how do, anth uh, how do archaeologists and paleoanthropologists know how old things are? Well, they use two main major uh, approaches um, to this, relative dating in which you sequence uh, particular um, objects or artifacts. Um, you arrange material evidence in a linear sequence. This is older than this. Versus numerical dating, where you actually identify when a rock layer was formed, a specific piece of clay was fired, a living animal died with radiocarbon dating. Um, dating methods have been based on laboratory techniques that assign age and years to material evidence. There are two main types of uh, numerical dating that I'll just touch on briefly. New, uh, relative dating has to do with um, notions of um, geology, the law of superposition, and the law of cross-cutting relationships. Uh, again, objects which are embedded in, in lower labor layers must be uh, older than those in upper layers if there's no disturbance indicated in the site. Uh, the Grand Canyon, of course, is an excellent example of this. Um, relative dating is based on biostratigraphic dating, seriation, and as well as assemblages. Um, numerical dating, there are two main types, isotopic, looking at the uh, rates of uh, various radioactive isotopes that naturally occur and transform themselves into other elements by losing subatomic particles, and non-isotoping uh, dating methods, which look at both tree rings as well as ice cores. 
So I hope to have provided you with a brief overview of the concepts of race, uh, evolutionary studies in terms of micro and macro evolution, and dating methods in paleoanthropology and archaeology, both relative and numerical dating.